Ha, ah, greetings fellow horror fans. Well, it's October and you know what that means. That's right, it's Horror Month 2022. Woo -woo. And this month, we're gonna be taking a look at my favorite horror franchise of all time, A Nightmare on Elm Street. That's right. So let's kick things off with the one that started all, 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street. Teenager Tina Gray wakens from a terrifying nightmare when a disfigured man wearing a, fix, wearing a blade fix glove attacks her in the boiler room. Her mother points out four mysterious slashes on her nightgown. The following morning, Tina's best friend Nancy Thompson and Nancy's boyfriend Glenn Lance console her, revealing they each also had a nightmare the previous night. They do stay at Tina's house when Tina's mother goes out of town, where she discovers that Nancy also had a nightmare about the disfigured man. Tina's boyfriend, Rod Lane, interrupts her sleepover. When Tina falls asleep, she dreams of the disfigured man chasing her. Rod is awakened by Tina's thrashing and sees her dragged and fatally slashed by an unseen force, forcing him to flee as Nancy and Glenn awaken to find Tina bloodied and dead. The next day, Nancy's policeman father, Don Thompson, arrests Rod despite his pleas of innocence. At school, Nancy falls asleep in class and dreams that the man chases her to the boiler room where she is cornered. She then deliberately burns her arm, burns her arm on a pipe. The burn starts her waking class as she notices a burn mark on her arm. Nancy visits her at the police station, who described Tina's death along with his own recent nightmares about the same man stalking her in her dreams, making Nancy believe that the man killed Tina. At home, Nancy falls asleep in the bathtub and is nearly drowned by the man. Nancy then depends on caffeine to stay awake and invites Glenn to watch over her as she sleeps. In her dream, Nancy sees the man prepared to kill Rod in his cell, but then he turns his attention towards her. Nancy runs away and wakes up when her alarm clock goes off. The man kills Rod by wrapping bedsheets around his neck, staging it as a suicide via hanging. At Rod's funeral, Nancy's parents become worried when she describes her dreams. Her mother, Marge, takes her to a sleep disorder clinic where, in a dream, Nancy grabs the man's fedora with the name Fred Krueger written in it and pulls it into the real world. After barricading the house, Marge explains that Krueger was an insane child murderer who killed 20 children but was released on technicality, and then burned alive by the victim's parents living on their street seeking vigilante justice. Nancy realizes that Kruger, now a vengeful ghost, is killing her inner friends out of revenge to satiate his psychopathic needs. Nancy tries to call Glenn to warn him, but his father prevents her from speaking to him. Glenn falls asleep and is killed by Kruger. Now alone, Nancy puts March to sleep and asks Don, who is across the suite investigating Glenn's death, to break into the house in 20 minutes. Nancy rigs booby traps around the house and grabs Kruger out of the dream and into the real world. The booby traps fed Kruger enough that Nancy can light him on fire and lock him in the basement. Nancy rushes to the door for help. The police arrive to find that Kruger has escaped from the basement. Nancy and Don go upstairs to find a burning, to find a burning Kruger smothering Marge in her bedroom. After Don extinguishes the fire, Kruger and Marge vanish into the bed. When Don leaves the room, Kruger rises from the bed behind Nancy. When seeing that Kruger is powered by his victim's fear, she calmly turns her back to him. Kruger evaporates when he attempts to lunge at her. Nancy steps, out in, step, Nancy steps outside into a bright and foggy morning where all her friends and her mother are still alive. Nancy gets into Glenn's convertible to go to school when the green and red striped top suddenly comes down and locks him in the car. Locks him in as the car drives uncontrollably down the street. The girls already dressed as playing jump rope are heard chanting Kruger's new rhyme as Marge is grabbed by Kruger through the front door window. Bum bum bum. And that's a little ambiguous, don't you think so? Yeah. Anyway, so let's take a look at the production of this movie beginning with the development. A Nightmare on Elm Street contains many, bio contains many biographical elements from director Wes Craven's childhood. The basis of the film was inspired by several newspaper articles printed in the Los Angeles Times in the 1970s about Hmong refugees who, after fleeing to the United States because of war and genocide in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, suffered disturbing nightmares and refused to sleep. Some of the men died in their sleep soon after. Medical authorities call the phenomenon Asian Death Syndrome. The condition affected men between the ages of 19 and 57 and was believed to be sudden unexplained death syndrome or Brigada syndrome or both. Chris stated, quote, It was a series of articles in the LA Times. Three small articles about men from Southeast Asia who were from families and had died in the middle of nightmares, and the paper never correlated them, never said, hey, we've had a story like this, end quote. The 1970s pop song Dreamweaver by Gary Wright would seal, seal the story for Craven, 
giving him not only an artistic site to jump off from, but a synthesizer riff for the movie's soundtrack. Craven has also stated that he drew some inspiration for the film from Eastern religions. Other sources attribute the inspiration for the film to be a 1968 student film made by Craven's students at Clarks University. The student film parodied contemporary horror films and was filmed along Elm Street in post Dam, New York. The film's villain, Freddy Krueger, is drawn from Craven's early life. One night, a young Craven's an elderly man walking on the side path outside the window of his home. The man stopped to glance at a startled Craven and walked off. This served as the inspiration for Krueger. Initially, Fred Krueger was intended to be a child molester, but Craven eventually characterized him as a child murderer to avoid being, ex to avoid being accused of exploiting a spate of high publicized child molestation cases that occurred in California around the time of production of the film. On Freddy's nature, Craven states that, quote, in a sense, Freddy stands for the worst of parenthood and adulthood, the dirty old man, the nasty father, and the adult who wants children to die rather than help them prosper. He's the boogeyman and the worst fear of children, the adult that's out to get them. He's a very promo figure, sort of like Cronus devouring his children, that evil twisted perverted father figure that wants to destroy and is able to get them at their most vulnerable moment, which is when they're asleep, end quote. By Craven's account, his adolescent experiences led him to the name Freddy Krueger. He had been bullied by a child named Fred Krueger. Craven did the same thing in his film The Last House on the Left, where the villain's name was shortened to Krug. Craven chose to make Kruger's writer red and green after reading an article in a 1982 Scientific American that said these two colors were the most clashing colors to the human retina. Craven showed to make Kruger differ from other horror villains of the era. A lot of the killers were wearing masks, like the base Michael Myers Jason, he recalled in 2014. I wanted my villain to have a mask, but but be able to talk and taunt the talk and taunt and threaten. So I, so I thought of him being burned and scarred. He also felt the killer should use something other than a knife because it was too because it was too common. So I thought, how about a glove of steak knives? I gave the idea to our special fix guy, Jim Doyle. Ultimately, two models of the glove, two models of the glove are built. The hero glove that was only used whenever anything needed to be cut, and the stunt glove that was less likely to cause injury. For a time, Craven had considered a sickle as the weapon of choice for the killer. <clears throat> Around the third or fourth drafts of the script, the iconic glove had become his final choice. And now on to the writing. Wes Craven began writing the screenplay for A Nightmare on Elm Street around 1981, after he had for, after finished production on Swamp Thing. He pitched to several studios, but each of them rejected it for different reasons. The first studio to show interest was Walt Disney Productions, although they wanted Craven to tone down the content to make it suitable for children and preteens. Craven declined. Another studio Craven pitched to was Paramount Pictures, but passed on the project due to similarity to Dreamscape. Excuse me. Universal Studios also passed. Craven, who was in desperate personal and financial straits during this period, later heard the company's rejection letter on the wall of his office, which reads, which reads, in its December 14th, 1982 print, we have reviewed your script. We have reviewed the script you have submitted, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Unfortunately, the script did not receive an enthusiastic response from us to go forward at this time. However, when you have finished, when you have a finished print, please get in touch and we will be delighted to screen it for a possible negative pickup. Finally, the fledgling independent New Line Cinema Corporation, which up to that point only, only distributed films, agreed to produce the film. During filming, New Line's distribution deal for the film fell through and for two weeks it was unpayable to its cast and crew. Although New Line has gone on to make bigger and more profitable films, An Hour on Elm Street was its first commercial success and the studio is often referred to as the house that Freddy built. New Line Cinema lacked the financial resources for, for the production themselves, so had to turn to external financers. They found two investors in England, who each contributed 40% and 30% respectively to the necessary funds. One of the producers of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre contributed 10%, and home video distributor Media Home Entertainment contributed 20% of the original budget. Four weeks before her production began, the English investor had contributed 40% back out, but, but medium entertainment added another 40% to the budget. Among the backers were also Hero Communications and Smart Inc. Pictures. According to Shea, all the film's original investors backed out at one point or another during pre-production. The original budget was $700,000. It ended by $1.1 million, had the funding came from a Yugoslavian guy who had a girlfriend he wanted in movies. Wow. 
And now let's take a look at the casting, beginning with Freddy. Actor David Warner was originally cast to play Freddy. Makeup tests were done, but he had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. Replacing him was difficult at first. Kane Hodder, who would later be best known for playing fellow slasher icon Jason Voorhees, was among those who Wes Craven talked about the role, talk, talked, talked with about the role of Freddy. According to Hodder, quote, I had a meeting with Craven about playing a character he was developing called Freddy Krueger. At the time, Wes wasn't sure what kind of person he wanted for the role of Freddy, so I had a good shot as anybody else. He was initially thinking of a big guy for the part. He was also thinking of somebody who had real burn scars, but obviously he changed his whole line of thinking with Robert England, who's smaller. I'd love to play the part, but I do think Wes made the right choice. Hodder would, in a way, eventually play Freddy as Hannah grabs Jason masks at the end at the at the epilogue and Jason goes to hell the final Friday. Wes Craven explains that. I could find an actor to play Freddy Krueger with the sense of ferocity I was I was seeking. Craven recalled on the film's 30th anniversary. Everyone was too quiet, too compassionate towards children. Then Robert England auditioned. He wasn't as tall as I'd hoped, and he had baby fat on his face, the impression of his willingness to go to the dark places in his mind. Robert understood Freddy. England has stated that Craven was indeed in search of a big giant man originally, but casting director Annette Benson had taught Craven into seeing him about the role after England had auditioned for National Lampoon's class reunion previously. For England's agent at the time, Joe Rice, sent him to the casting office, Rice's friend Red Topham recommended England to act rat like, weasel like, and that when we read about abusers and molesters in the newspaper, they're not big, hulking men, but weasels. I think it should go in a play like that, and it worked. England had darkened, had darkened his lower eyelids of cigarette ash on his way to the audition and slicked his hair back. I looked strange. I sat there and listened to Wes talk. He was tall, preppy, and erudite. I posed a bit like Klaus Kinski, and that was the audition, he said later. He took the part because it was the only project that fit his schedule during the hiatus between the V miniseries and series. And I went to the casting of Nancy. Craven said he wanted someone very non-Hollywood for the role of Nancy, and believed Lingenkamp meant his quality. Lingenkamp, who had appeared in several commercials and TV film, had taken time off from her studies at Stanford to continue acting. Eventually, she later role Nancy Thompson after an open audition, beating on more than 20 actor 200 actresses. Lingenkamp was already known to, to Deb Benson as she auditioned for The Night of the Comet and Last Starfighter previously, losing out to Kath Catherine Mary Stewart at both occasions. Demi Moore, Courtney Cox, Tracy Gold, and Jennifer Grey have all been rumored to have auditioned for A Nightmare on Elm Street, but Benson definitely ruled out Moore and Cox and was also, also being sure of Gold and Grey. Lane Camp returned as Nancy in Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors and also played a fictionalist version of, version of herself in Wes Craven's new Nightmare. There are no separate auditions for the characters of Tina and Nancy. Actors who auditioned for one of the two female roles read for them Nancy, and upon being called back, were mixed with other actresses trying to find uh, trying to find a pair that had chemistry. Amanda Weiss was among those who switched to Tina after a callback. Weiss immediately decided immediately upon Mixie Weiss and Lingenkamp that this was the duo he wanted. Craven then mixed the duo with auditioners for the male teenage roles trying to find actors who had chemistry with Wiss and or Lingenkamp. And now finally on to the casting of Glenn. Johnny Depp was somewhat unknown when he was cast. Initial coming his friend, Jack Earl Haley, who went out to play Freddy in the 2010 remake to an audition. According to Deb, the role of Glenn was initially written as a big, blonde, beach jock football player guy, far from his own appearance. Both career stars picked up picked up Deb's headshot from the set he showed them. Deb got his own nod in a cameo role in Freddy's Dead the Final Name, where, as he went on TV and later in the Freddy vs. Jason intro and clips from earlier films. Charlie Sheen was considered for the role, but allegedly wanted too much money. Annette Benson states that they did in fact offer the part to Sheen, but he passed on it due to his agent demanding twice the weekly wage of $1,142 for Sheen, which only cinema did not consider themselves to have the budget for. Sheen himself objects the sentiment that he turned down the role for the reason of money, saying, quote, I didn't price myself out of it because I didn't get greedy until 10 years later. That came much later. I just didn't get it. And I went a bit more wrong about interpreting a script. I just didn't get it completely, but I still took a meeting with Wes. But a minute I said, and when I met with him, I said, Look, with all due respect, and as a fan of your talents, 
She also see this guy wearing a funny hat with a rotted face and striped sweater and a bunch of clacky fingers. I just don't see this catching on. Mark Patton, who will later be cast as Jesse Walsh in the sequel, auditioned for like Glenn Lance and claimed that the auditioners have been windowed down to him and Johnny Depp before Depp got the role. Other actors like John Cusack, Brad Pitt, Keith Sutherland, Nicholas Cage, and C. Thomas Howell have been mentioned over the years, but Nick Benson has failed to definitely recall those actors as being among the auditioners. Though Cage probably not auditioned for Nightmare on Elm Street, he was in fact involved Introducing Johnny Depp to acting, the Cage's own agent who had introduced Benson to him was also in, in an audition for the film. And now let's take a look at the actual filming of the movie. Press World Photography began on June 11, 1984 and lasted a total of 32 days in and around Los Angeles, California. The high school the protagonist attended was filmed at John Marshall High School, whereas many other productions such as Grease and Pretty Pink have been filmed. <clears throat> The fictional street address of Nancy's house in the film is 1428 Elm Street. Around this house is a private home located in Los Angeles at 1428 North Gensey Avenue. The last family home is at 1419 North Gensey Avenue on the other side of the road. <coughs> the boiler room scenes in police station interior were shot at Lincoln Heights Jail, close to the 1965 building. <coughs> Where the exterior for use for the police station was the Chinooga Branch Library. Rod's Bear was filmed at Evergreen Cemetery. The American Jewish University of 1600 Molon Drive was used at the Katja, Katja Institute for the Study of Sleep Disorders, visited by Marge and Nancy. During production, over 500 gallons of fake blood were used for a special effects production. For the blood geyser sequence, the filmmakers used the same revolving room set that was used for Tina's death. When filming the scenes, the cameraman had craved himself for mounted and fixed seats taken from a Datsun B B210 car while the set rotated. The film crew rid the set and attached the camera so that it looked like the room was right side up. Then they poured the red water into the room. They used dyed water because the special effects blood did not have the right look for a geyser. During filming of this scene, the red water was poured out in an unexpected way that caused the rotating room to spin. Much of the water spilled in the bedroom. Much of the water spilled out of the bedroom window covering Craven and Langenkamp. Earth's gravity was also used to film another take for the TV version, which the skeleton shoots out of the hollowed bed and smashes into the ceiling. More work was done for Freddy's boiler room that made it into the film. The film crew constructed a whole sleeping place for Freddy, showing that he was quite a hobo, an outcast and reject, and reject from society, living and sleeping where he worked. And surrounding, surrounding himself with naked Barbie dolls and other things as a showcase of his fantasies and perversions. The place was supposed to be where he forced his glove and abducted and murdered his victims. The scene where Nancy is attacked by Kruger in her bathtub was accompanied by a special bottomless tub. The tub was put in a bathroom set that was built, built up over a swimming pool. During the underwater sequence, Heather Langenkamp was replaced with the stunt woman. The melting staircase in Nancy's dream was Robert Shea's idea based on his own nightmares. Was created using pancake mix. The film's special effects are as Jim Doyle portrayed Freddy on the scene where his face and hands stretched out through the wall and reached out for Nancy when she dreams. The wall was built by Doyle out of spandex. The scene where Freddy walks through the prison bars to threaten and rod as seen by Nancy was created with swings that quote, object triangulations of the camera so we knew exactly the height of it from the floor and angle towards the point where the killer was going to walk through. And then we put the camera again at the exact height and walked the actor through that space. Then those two images were married and a rotoscope artist went through and matted out the bar so it appeared they were going straight through his body. Sue Garcia, who was, credited, who was cast as a writer and credited as Nick Corey, says the production was difficult for him. He was dealing with depression due to recent homelessness by starting heroin in the bathroom between takes. 2014, he felt that he was high on heroin during the scene with Langenkamp in the jail cell. His eyes were watery and they weren't focused, Langenkamp said. I thought, wow, he's giving the best performance of his life. Following Tina's death, Nancy repeatedly dreams of an, an, of an, an, of an animated corpse of Tina in a translucent body bag. During the scene in which Freddy kills Rod in the prison cell, Nancy witnesses a centipede crawl up Tina's mouth. The filmmakers initially attempted to achieve this effect by having Weiss Force a rubber centipede out of her mouth. The 
effect of the final film was accomplished by having actual centipede crawl in the mouth of sculptor Weiss's likeness, sculpted by David, David B. Miller. During filming, the centipede was temporarily lost on set before being found again. About halfway through the film, when Nancy's trying to stay awake, a scene from Sam Raimi's Evil Dead appears on a television. Graham decided to include this scene because Raimi had featured the Hells Have Eyes poster in The Evil Dead. In return, Raimi featured a Freddy Krueger, Freddy Krueger glove in the workshed, in the workshed scene of Evil Dead 2, and later in Ash vs. Evil Dead. Sean Cunningham, who, who Wes Craven had previously worked with while filming The Last House on the Left, helped Craven at the end of shoot at the end of shooting. Had in the second unit, had in the second unit film, had in the second film unit during the filming of some Nancy's dream scenes. Craven originally planned for the film to have a more evocative ending. Nancy kills Kruger by ceasing to believe in him. The way he discovered everything that happened in the film was an elongated nightmare. However, an only later rubber shape demanded a twist ending, in which Kruger disappears and all seems to have been a dream. I forgot to discover that it was a dream within a dream within a dream. According to Craven, quote, the original ending of the script has Nancy come out the door. It was initially, it's an usually cloudy and foggy day. A car pulls up with her dead friends in it. She's startled. She gets, she goes out and gets in the car, wondering what the hell is going on, and they drive off into the fog. But the mother left standing on the doorstep, and that's it. It was very brief and suggests and suggestive that maybe a life is sort of like, I mean, life is sort of dreamlike too. She wanted Freddy Krueger to be driving the car and have the kids screaming. It all became very negative. I felt a philosophical tension to my ending. She said, quote, she said, that's so 60s. It's stupid. I've used that Freddy in driver's seat. And we thought up about five different endings. The one we used, with Freddy pulling the mother at the doorway, amused us all so much that we couldn't not use it. Grave explains that the effect of the mentioned fog did not work out for the team and they had to film it. They had to film without it. There were around 20 persons of fog machines but the race of the time was too much, and the fog was gone before they had the opportunity to film the intentionally foggy scene. The several variants of an end scene were considered and filmed. Heather Lankamp states, states that, quote, there always, there always was this sense that Freddy was the car. According to Sarah Richard, quote, it was, it was always was the idea to pant a little girl's jumping rope. Both the happy ending and twist ending were filmed, but the final film used a twist ending. As a result, Craven, who never wanted the film to be an ongoing franchise, did not work on the first sequel, Freddy's Revenge. The film wrapped at the end of July, and the film was rushed to get ready for its November release. Hmm. So now let's so now finally let's take a look at the themes of this movie. Freddy exclusively attacks teenagers as actions have been interpreted as symbolic of the often traumatic experiences of adolescence. Nancy, like their archetypal like a typical teenager, expresses social anxiety in a relationship where her parents become strained. Sexuality is present in Freudian images and is almost exclusively displayed in a threatening and mysterious context. E.g., Tina's death visually evokes a rape, Freddy's glow between Nancy's legs in the bath. The original script called for, called for Kruger to be a child molester rather than a child murderer before being murdered. Ms. Kruger has, has explained that, quote, The notion of screenplay is that the sense of the parents are visited upon the children. The fact that each child is not necessarily struck with their lot is still there. Struck with their lot is still there. Robert England asserts that, quote, in Nightmare, all the adults are damaged. They're alcoholic, they're on pills, they're not around. Blake like says the parents in the film spares the film version of being villains. England adds, quote, the adolescents have to wade through that, and others are as the last girl standing. She lives, she defeats Freddy. Then Kevin reads, quote, Nightmare is a feminist movie, but I look at it as more of a youth power film. And that's true, and that is definitely true. <laughs> so overall, I really do like this movie, and while it's not my personal favorite, it's still a really damn good movie, and I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it already, so there you go. So overall, I give A Nightmare on Elm Street, five jack-o'-lanterns, actually, let's take that back, I give it five clog, five Freddy gloves out of five. Anyway, tune in tomorrow as we take a look next entry in the series on Emory on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge. So, until then, in the words of Nancy Thompson, whatever you do, don't fall asleep.